In the 1860s, railway experts jeered at Robert Fairley for building a locomotive with two engines facing opposite directions. They called it a two-headed freak, and they said it would never survive the mountains. But while traditional locomotives failed on curves of 132 feet and on slopes of 1 in 80, Fairley's creation offered something no rigid engine could. Double the load, no turntables, and true bi-directional power. Every rule book said it shouldn't work. So why did the mountain lines bet everything on this outcast design? And what happened next that forced the world to reconsider everything they thought they knew about railways? Railways built for the flatlands of England and Scotland faced a different world when they reached the mountains. The Festiniog Railway, slicing through the slate country of Wales, offered no gentle curves or easy grades. Instead, its track twisted through the hills on a radius as tight as 132 feet what engineers called a two-chain curve, and climbed relentlessly at a slope of one in 80. Victorian doctrine insisted that stability meant a long, rigid wheelbase. But on these tracks, that thinking led straight to disaster. Locomotives designed for broad, sweeping turns simply could not negotiate the sharp bends without their wheels grinding against the rails flanges shrieking, and axles forced sideways until something gave. Derailments were common, even when the engines stayed on the rails. Their rigid frames fought every curve, wearing out both metal and patience. The challenge only grew steeper as the trains climbed. Steam locomotives rely on the weight pressing their driving wheels to the track for traction, what engineers call adhesion. On a 1 in 80 grade, gravity saps that grip. If a locomotive's weight isn't perfectly balanced, or if too many wheels are just along for the ride instead of driving, the wheels begin to slip. Standard designs wasted precious weight on unpowered axles or trailing tenders, further reducing the force available to haul heavy loads uphill. The Festiniage's early engines, built for straighter, easier lines, could only pull short trains before they lost their footing or stalled on the grade. Curve after curve, incline after incline, the mountain railway exposed the limits of conventional wisdom. Every attempt to stretch the wheelbase for more power only made the problem worse. Longer engines locked up on the bends, while shorter ones lacked the muscle for the climb. No amount of tweaking could square this circle. The geometry of the track and the physics of adhesion set hard boundaries that no rigid locomotive could cross. For the men running the railway, it was a daily battle against both the landscape and the limits of established engineering. The mountain did not care about tradition, and neither did the laws of mechanics. Turntables became an unavoidable expense for railways like the Festinia, forced into service by the limitations of their locomotives. Each installation at a terminus demanded a significant outlay, sometimes hundreds of pounds for a single mechanism, not counting the extra land, masonry, and labor to keep them in working order. For a narrow gauge line running on tight margins, these were not minor sums. The railway ledgers from the 1860s list entries for turntable repairs and replacements with costs piling up year after year. Every train that reached the end of the line had to be turned before it could make the return journey. Crews waited as engines were uncoupled, eased onto the platform, and spun by hand. On busy days, the queue stretched down the track, wagons loaded with slate sitting idle, while profits leaked away minute by minute. Back at the quarries, the delay rippled outward. Dispatch records show growing backlogs in the slate yards, with finished blocks piling up faster than trains could clear them. In peak years, as much as 200,000 tons of slate waited to move. Every hour lost to turntable maneuvers cut into the railway's ability to keep up with demand. The cost was not just measured in maintenance or wages, it showed up in missed orders, dissatisfied customers, and a reputation for unreliability that threatened the entire slate trade. Victorian accountants tracked every penny, and the numbers told a clear story. The more the railway relied on old-fashioned turnarounds, the deeper the hole in its balance sheet. 
the Festiniog's management faced a hard choice, keep pouring money into stopgap solutions, or find a way to move trains faster with fewer delays and less wasted capital. The pressure to solve this economic choke point grew with every passing season. Robert Fairley's patent, filed in 1864, described a locomotive that looked almost alien compared to anything else on the rails. At its heart was a single, elongated boiler mounted lengthwise along the frame. Instead of a cab at one end and a smoke box at the other, Fairley's machine had identical faces at both ends, each with its own chimney, water tank, and driving controls. The real departure from tradition, though, lay underneath. Instead of a fixed frame resting on rigid wheels, the entire locomotive was perched on two independent power trucks, or bogies. Each bogey carried its own set of cylinders and four driving wheels, all powered directly by the steam from the central boiler. These bogies could pivot freely beneath the frame, swinging side to side as the locomotive negotiated the sharpest bends the Festiniog Railway could throw at it. The arrangement was symmetrical, and both bogies could be the front or the rear, depending on which direction the train was running. There was no tender trailing behind, and no wasted weight on unpowered wheels. Every axle beneath the locomotive contributed to traction, maximizing the force pressing the wheels to the rails. Fairley's patent diagrams show this clearly. One continuous boiler, straddled in the middle by a firebox that could serve both engines, and flanked on each end by a set of independently turning wheels. The design allowed the locomotive to travel forward or backward with equal ease, and to distribute its weight evenly across all wheels, reducing the risk of derailment on tight curves. This was not a mere tweak to existing practice. Victorian engineers were used to thinking of locomotives as long, solid beams, stable only if every wheel pointed the same way and every axle locked in line. Fairley's articulated system broke that mental model. The pivoting bogies seemed to threaten stability, and the double-ended form looked almost like two engines joined at the middle. Yet every detail was there for a reason, to solve the specific, stubborn problems of mountain railways. The patent, with its careful cross-sections and measurements, offered a blueprint for something radically new, a locomotive that could flex and twist with the track rather than fight against it. The hardware was as unconventional as the thinking, the thinking behind it, and for many engineers it was almost too much to accept. Robert Fairley's patent did more than sketch a strange new locomotive. It laid out a challenge to the accepted mathematics of railway traction. Victorian engineers measured a locomotive's worth by its tractive effort, how much force the wheels could press into the rails before slipping. In theory, Every pound of weight on a driving wheel should translate directly into pulling power. In practice, most engines wasted half their weight on idle axles or heavy tenders. Fairley's design aimed to change that equation entirely. Instead of a long, rigid frame with a handful of powered wheels, the double-ended engine rode on two pivoting bogies, each with four driving wheels. Every wheel was powered. Every ton of the locomotive's weight counted toward adhesion. That meant, on paper, Fairley's machine could outpull a conventional engine of the same size by a wide margin. The calculations were simple, but bold. With eight driving wheels and no dead weight, the adhesive force available for climbing grades or hauling heavy trains was nearly doubled. Where a standard 040 tank engine might slip and stall, the Fairley could keep its grip. The other radical promise was flexibility. With both bogies able to pivot independently, the locomotive could thread its way through the tightest curves without binding or derailing. The math supported this. The effective wheelbase, the distance over which the engine had to bend, was cut in half. That meant less wear on rails and wheels, fewer derailments, and the ability to run longer, heavier trains on tracks once thought impassable. Victorians loved numbers, and Fairley's numbers suggested a solution no one else had managed, a locomotive that could conquer both steep grades and sharp curves without compromise. Perhaps most tantalizing, the symmetrical double-ended form eliminated the need for turntables entirely. 
the engine could pull a train into a mountain terminus, stop, and then head back the way it came. No uncoupling, no spinning, no lost time. For a railway struggling to move slate fast enough to meet demand, this was a breakthrough worth more than any single improvement in speed or power. The checklist for a real-world trial was clear. Double the load, handle the curves, climb the grades, and do it all without a single wasted motion. On paper, the two-headed freak looked set to rewrite the rules of mountain railroading. All that remained was to prove it on the tracks. On the morning of February 11, 1870, a crowd of engineers and railway officials gathered along the narrow tracks of the Festiniog Railway. The air was thick with skepticism and anticipation. At the center stood the new prototype, the product of Fairley's patent and months of work at George England & Co. Its two identical ends, twin chimneys, and long central boiler drew stares and whispers, but it was the power hidden beneath that would settle the debate. The test began with a full slate train, heavier than any the line had seen. The locomotive crew fired both boilers and the double bogeyed machine eased forward. As it rounded the first tight curve, just 132 feet in radius, its frame flexed, bogies pivoting smoothly, every wheel gripping the rails. Where rigid engines had fought the bends and skidded, Fairley's design flowed through without a hitch. Then came the climb. The one in 80 grade had humbled every previous locomotive, forcing short trains and frequent stops. This time, the double-ended engine pushed steadily upward, steam pouring from both chimneys, wheels biting hard into the track. The logs from that day recorded a feat that stunned the onlookers. The engine hauled more than double the usual load, all the way to the summit without slipping or stalling. Engineers from Russia, Mexico, and beyond watched as the two-headed freak delivered what the calculations had promised, but few had believed. The Festiniog Railway's managers saw, in real time, a solution to their mountain of problems. The demonstration ended with applause and a sense that something fundamental had changed. The doubters had come expecting failure. What they witnessed instead was a locomotive that had conquered the impossible. Word of the F. Festiniog trials traveled fast. Within weeks, Delegations from across Europe and the Americas arrived in North Wales, each determined to see the double-ended locomotive in action. Russian engineers representing the Ministry of Railways studied the articulated bogies and measured the tight curves with their own instruments. They needed a solution for the twisting, snowbound lines of the Caucasus. Mexican railway officials, fresh from the mountain passes between Veracruz and Mexico City, watched the fairly handle grades steeper than anything back home. They sent for technical drawings before the smoke had even cleared from the last demonstration run. From New Zealand, surveyors dispatched by the Public Works Department took careful notes. The Southern Alps demanded locomotives that could snake through river gorges and switchbacks. Sweden's observers, working on narrow gauge timber lines, saw a way to bring heavy loads out of the forests without doubling the track. Even engineers from the Denver and Rio Grande in the United States facing the Rockies arrived to assess whether the Fairley design could conquer Colorado's notorious curves and grades. Each group brought its own set of problems, but all saw the same answer in Fairley's machine. The Festiniog Railway became a living laboratory a place where railway men from distant continents could witness a locomotive defy the limits that had stalled their own ambitions. Orders followed quickly. Mexico became the first country outside Britain to adopt the design, shipping a fairly across the Atlantic within a year. Russia placed requests for their own, um, for their own mountain lines. The rush of interest proved that the so-called two-headed freak was not just a local curiosity, but a blueprint for railways facing impossible terrain around the world. Mexico's mountain railways moved quickly. By 1871, a fairly double-ended locomotive steamed up the slopes of the Veracruz line, 
making light work of the sharp switchbacks and relentless grades that had stymied every conventional engine before it. Local records show the train's progress through the Sierra Madre, where curves were tightened to fit the terrain and gradients topped 1 in 40 in places. The Fairley, fresh from its Welsh debut, climbed steadily with a full load, its twin power bogies distributing weight evenly, and gripping rails that had defeated older designs. Word spread along the line. A British invention was taming Mexican mountains that had long been considered impassable by steam. Russian engineers across the globe faced their own test, the Caucasus Railway, threading through steep, snowbound passes, needed a locomotive that could handle winter's worst. After witnessing the Festiniog trials, Russia placed its orders. By 1872, fairly engines hauled freight and troops along twisting routes, their articulated frames flexing around icy bends where rigid engines risked derailment. Russian railway bulletins noted the new arrivals, double-ended, powerful, and unlike anything seen before on the Tsar's rails. New Zealand's government engineers, searching for a way through the Southern Alps, followed suit. The Otago Central and other lines took delivery of Fairley locomotives in the mid-1870s. On tracks hugging river gorges and climbing toward the clouds, these engines proved their worth. Local reports praised their ability to pull long trains through curves as tight as 100 feet, with no need for costly turntables or extra track. From the Welsh slate fields to the peaks of the Andes and the Pacific Rim, the so-called two-headed freak was fast becoming the engine of choice wherever mountains refused to yield. Major locomotive builders, once dismissive of Fairley's double-ended design, began quietly adopting its most effective features. Catalogs from the 1870s and the 1880s show a sudden rise in articulated bogey locomotives, their advertisements touting improved flexibility and enhanced curve negotiation, but rarely mentioning fairly by name. Articulation became a selling point, repackaged as modern engineering rather than a borrowed solution. Buyer Peacock, Avonside Engine Company, and other giants rolled out their own versions, sometimes with cosmetic tweaks, but the underlying mechanics owed everything to the so-called two-headed freak. Yet as these imitations spread, the original Fairley locomotive faced a new threat, not from ridicule, but from progress itself. Railway infrastructure was changing. Advances in tunneling and earth moving made it possible to ease gradients and straighten tracks. Main lines expanded, their curves broadening, and their grades gentling to 1 in 100 or less. With the terrain tamed, the need for extreme articulation and bi-directional operation faded. Speed became the new obsession. Express trains demanded engines that could run smoothly at 60 miles per hour or more, a realm where the double-ended design, with its twin power bogies and complex steam routing, struggled to keep up. Builders shifted focus to rigid frame locomotives optimized for straight, fast running. Market demand for Fairley's solution shrank, even as his ideas lived on in the bones of newer engines. By the early 20th century, articulated locomotives were still solving problems on remote mountain lines, but the mainstream had moved on. The original genius was subsumed by the very industry that once laughed at him, his so-called two-headed freak design, now a footnote in the catalogs of companies that had once scorned its inventor. Innovation often looks absurd until it changes everything. Today, as engineers face new frontiers, Fairley's legacy endures. The world's toughest problems rarely yield to conventional thinking. The original Festiniog Fairleys still run, living proof that ridicule can be the first step toward revolution. What we dismiss today may may drive tomorrow's breakthroughs. Thanks for watching. What risks do you think are worth taking now?